Good evening, good evening, and welcome along to Robin Elliott tonight here on NVTV. Coming up on the show tonight, I'll be chatting all about Mother's Day to the very lovely Hilary Whitehall. Also, footballing legend Jerry Armstrong is going to be with us in the studio. We'll have live music from folk legend Tommy Sands, and also from a new singer-songwriter called Neve Murray. We'll be chatting to Rosemary Jenkinson all about her brand new book of short stories, and Finty Williams and Amy McGoldrick will be here telling us all about the ocean at the end of the lane which opens at Belfast Grand Opera House during the week. So that's all coming up on the show this evening. So we're in for a busy weekend uh, this weekend because, of course, uh, today is uh, St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody, by the way. And, of course, it's also Mother's Day on a Sunday. And to help us all forget uh, the heartache of forgetting to buy our mum a present on Mother's Day, we're joined on the line by the very lovely Hilary Whitehall. Hilary, how are you? How are you? Very well, thank you. So, of course, it is uh, Mother's Day this coming Sunday, and we're trying to help people not forget uh, the all-important day. So, to start with, would you say that you're a forgetful person or not? Uh, no, I'm actually quite organised. I think um, I, yeah, I've always been quite organised. But even at school, I used to have, you know, different coloured gel pens and lots of notepads and all that kind of stuff. It's a very girl thing, I know. But, yeah, so I'm quite organised. Lists, lists. I'm big on a list. So obviously you've never forgotten Mother's Day and all the important dates and the calendar and stuff like that then? No, my children once forgot Mother's Day when they were teenagers and I it took a bit of getting over because um, they didn't get me anything, literally nothing. And I sat through a fairly terse breakfast thinking I'm going to have to try and be the bigger person here and just forget it. But um, so I thought, I oh, know, I'll go and have a bath, have a bit of a soak, just relax went upstairs turned the bath on and then thought no I'm not the bigger person I'm really cross about this so I went back downstairs and I gave them 10 minutes of both barrels about how selfish they were and how thoughtless and I mean not least getting not not getting me anything they could have made me a card for goodness sake but no they didn't even do that and it was 10 minutes of a major rant and I came out of there having done that went back into the hall and there was literally water pouring through the ceiling because I hadn't turned the bath off. <laughs> and of course, we have to mention that uh, your son is Jack Whitehall. So is he a good son? Does he buy good gifts? Do you know what? He is a very good son. He's a very generous son, but he has a brain like a sieve in terms of logistics. He's c comedically brilliant. On stage, he remembers things all the time and has you know, an hour and a half comedy set in his head, never gets it wrong, never makes a wrong step. When it comes to life, he's hopeless, absolutely hopeless. And my daughter, because I have three children, I have two sons and a daughter, and somebody asked me the other day, which one of your children is the most organized? And I said, well, I have two sons and a daughter, work it out for yourself. <laughs> so when they do buy you gifts then, is there a lot of thought put into it? You know what? They're pretty good, actually. I think, uh, you know, my favourite for Mothering Sunday, because let's face it, the most the most valuable gift you can give your children is your time, to be honest. Um, but they're very good at clubbing together and taking us out for a meal because we love food, you know, real foodies and, and spending time with them because they're all busy young adults now. They've got their own lives. My, my daughter is now a mother. She's having another baby. This is her second Mothering Sunday. Um, and I say Mothering Sunday because, of course, I like to include all figures who are in that role. I think Mothering Sunday covers that nicely because obviously families come in all different shapes and sizes now. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, yeah, celebrating and being grateful for things is good. It's good for your mental health apart from anything else. So. So our mothers give us good advice from time to time and pass on some words of wisdom. So is there anything that was passed on to you from your mother that you now pass on to your children? Well, yeah, don't forget important dates, for one. She loved a gift card as well. Yeah. She, I mean, I actually, on occasions, gave her a one-for-all gift card, and it was like the best gift I'd ever given her because, right. of course, she could go to all these different outlets and choose whatever she wanted. Um, the great thing, too, about the um, one for all gift card is that you can get a digital version. So if you do take it right to the wire and forget, you can get it on the morning and you can do it. You can add a video message to it and send it to your mother that way, which exactly. is very cool. It's personalized because a personalized gift 
is a good one. So if you're sitting around the breakfast table then on Sunday and your mum is getting grumpy because uh, there's no present for her, just get out your phone and get her a gift card then. Yes, buy a, a one for all gift card digitally and put a video message on it. But I mean, I think also Mothering Sunday in this country is there to, to trip you up because of course it's linked to Easter, which is linked to the phases of the moon. So it's never on the same day. It's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? And of course, here in Belfast, it's going to be a massive uh, celebration all weekend with uh, St. Patrick's Day today and then, of course, Mother's Day on Sunday. I think there may be one or two mothers who get forgotten on that weekend. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, hangover cure probably is the best present you could give your mother <laughs> that day. <laughs> so what's your plans for the weekend then? Well, as I said, it's my, my granddaughter's second birthday that weekend. So um, I think the weekend has been going to be slightly more focused on that because she has a party on the Saturday. But we are all going out for a meal and I'm going to spoil my daughter because it's her second year as a mother. So that was my plan. Any other exciting projects uh, coming up for you? Because, of course, uh, we do love uh, the podcast at the moment as well. Thank you. Yes. Well, well, I have to say that Michael and I love doing the Wittering White Horse. It, and in, I'm, we haven't discussed Mother's Day on the podcast, but I'm sure we will be at some point. But we love it because people have really engaged with it and we get um, emails from all over the world. It's been amazing and we love it. So thank you to all our DLs, as you, I'm sure you know, I call the dear listeners. Um, we've loved it. We've absolutely loved it. And in just engaging with people has been great. And were you surprised how quickly the podcast took off? Because uh, you're doing really massive figures, aren't you? Michael didn't even know what a podcast was. He still thinks it's the wireless. I mean, <laughs> but no, we've been absolutely bowled over by the success of it. It's been extraordinary. Who knew? Who knew? And what about some telly stuff? Would you love to do some more? I had a little tiny role in Bad Education, Jack, very sweetly way way back in the first series gave me a little role and the character whose mother I play is now obviously a teacher he was a boy in the first first lot of series and now that they've rebooted it and he's a teacher so I've come back as Mrs Carmichael which is very wow. exciting and I also because my I now have a granddaughter and another grandchild on the way um I do the voice of a character in a cartoon series called Moly which is on I think it's on Boomerang um, every afternoon it's a the character of, of a little mole who's played by Warwick Davis and I play Miss Petunia in wow. Moly which I love doing I've never done um, a voice on an animation before and it's great fun well Hilary it's been great talking to you if people want some more information on the all for one gift cards where do they go to for that onefull.com and I think uh, yeah on the website but also if you go to the post office or any supermarkets I mean I tend to pick them up in the post office because you know that scenario in the post office when you've got one thing to do in the post office and you wait in the queue for 45 minutes that's when I buy my one for all gift cards because they're right there very handy excellent some great advice there thank you for joining us and have yourself a great weekend same to you bye OK, time for some live music in the NVTV studios. And earlier on this week, I caught up with a singer-songwriter from Lurgan. She's called Neve Murray. And before we talk to her, here she is with her brand new single. This is called All For You. If you see a flame in the dark Well, it's burning through my heart And it burns for you You can see it everywhere And you can breathe in the air of its sweet perfume Cause it's all for you It's all for you It's all for you It's all for you see your eyes through mine tonight look into the sky for sunrise for we know we're running on precious time precious time as we dance beneath the moon and stars to a song I 
So there we go, some brand new music live in the NVTV studios. That's uh, Neve Murray, that's a track called All For You, and I'm pleased to say she joins us now. How are you? Not too bad, we're having a mortgage. So tell us about that song, what's the kind of story behind it then? Well, it kind of does what it says in the tin. I suppose uh, I wrote the song about just someone someone in my life anyways, you know, somebody that you would, you're willing to do absolutely anything for. and. Um, you'd will and like the, the chorus is like as we dance beneath the moon and stars like and, you know you want to spend most of your time with that person and you would do absolutely anything for them so that's basically what the song's about. And the great thing is it's picking up lots of airplay and stuff isn't it at the moment? It is I'm happy enough with it now I can't I can't uh, I can't lie and it's very different from a lot of the other stuff that I've done um it's probably more of a, a slower you know slower type song and more like a reflective song whereas everything else I've written is quite poppy so yeah. I like this we change now yeah. And music's been part of your life like forever really hasn't it? Pretty much forever yeah I've been whenever um, I was younger I would have studied like a lot of classical music and I sung classical for a good few years and then when I went to university you know that kind of woke me up to a lot of different genres and I must say I did get hooked on on starting to write music and that's probably where I, I really started you know getting involved in things like that and starting to, you know, gig locally and things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy with all of that too. And it's a nice wee change for me as well. And was there always music around you and your family and stuff? Yeah, music's definitely been, well, I've, there's a big family back home. So music's definitely been a part of our lives. And my mum and my dad would have played a lot of stuff from their era too. And then my nanny and my grand have played their stuff. And then over the time, you just kind of pick out what you like the best. And then subconsciously, you're, when you're writing something, it's probably something you've picked up from your favourite artist, you know, and you start evolving and coming up with your own sound and style. So do you remember the first song you ever wrote? 
Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank God I'll not be playing anywhere. <laughs> There's a lovely wee song called Sweet Melody. Um, yeah, and don't even ask me <laughs> what it was about. Um, I think it was like my first attempt at writing like a, a love song because I thought when I was younger that's that's what every song's about. You know, yeah. it has to be about a love song. No idea what love was like, but sure, uh, I wrote it anyways. But uh, I can know I still have it. But yeah. I, I'm I'm thinking of maybe, you know, going back and trying to clean it up a wee bit and maybe make it into actually something that oh may be worth God. releasing, yeah. Brilliant. But it, yeah, it was just a wee stupid four chords and nothing much to it and me just singing about love at 13. Wow, so after the success of the latest single then, is it going to be an album to follow or something? Yeah, well that's that's the hope at the moment. I'm going back into the studio here probably at the st end of March actually and I've got um, a good few new songs so whether or not you know we can come up with things we might end up evolving into an, an album or another EP yeah. but for now I've got one song that I really want to work on and get it out there sort of thing. What about live gigs and stuff can we come and see you anywhere? Um, that's my job at the moment I, I, I gig on the regular whether it's in Belfast or in Derry or um, back home in Lurgan, you know, mm -hmm. just playing all the time, which is great, and it's probably the best thing for you as well as a as a musician to be playing uh, um, regularly. So um, yeah, between Belfast and back home, I'm playing all the time. The live music scene here in Northern Ireland's really good at the minute, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, especially in Belfast. I must admit, now Lurgan is good, but there's you know Lurgan's small, like yes, you know. So yeah. Belfast, definitely when I come down to Belfast, it's a nice wee change, and there's always a crowd Monday to Sunday, and it's. Just good crack and good vibes, and everyone loves the music, so makes it makes my job a lot easier, sort of thing. Brilliant. Well, if people want to follow you, you're on all the socials and stuff. I'm on the socials, yes, on absolutely anything. <laughs> I am on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, music's all on um, any live streaming platforms. So go and get it. Brilliant. Well, good to see you. Good Thank you so you much too. for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, uh, Rosemary Jenkinson has got a brand new book out at the moment. It's called Love in the Time of Chaos. We'll chat to Rosemary about it in just a second after we hear an extract from the book and a short story called McCrory's Millionaire. I'll get the wine in, says Dad. Does he drink red or white? He doesn't drink. Dad's mouth goldfishes. He doesn't drink? Not a drop. How do you think he got to be a millionaire? Would he not drink low alcohol? Dad is almost pleading here. It's just as well Tony doesn't drink. Every man I've ever brought to the house has been drunk under the table by my dad. He calls it hospitality, but it's almost like he's testing them, like it's an arm wrestle to see if they're genetically fit enough to join the McCrory clan. The next morning, after a dawn assault of hoovering, dusting, window leaning, bleaching, polishing and cushion plumping, the house is ready to accommodate a millionaire. Dad returns home from Tesco's with a boatload of food, more than you could legally cross the Irish Sea border with. In two flicks of a lamb's tail, mum has dad topping and tailing the beans and me trimming the fat from the fatted calf. Fortunately, Tony is not a vegetarian, which would be an added insult after his teetotalitarianism. So there we go. That was uh, Rosemary Jenkinson reading an extract from uh, McCrory's Millionaire, which is just uh, one of many great stories uh, featured in her latest collection of short stories, Love in the Time of Chaos. Let's find out more because she's here. How are you? Good, yeah, just fresh off my typewriter. <laughs> well, <laughs> computer. <laughs> you just finished the Silent Trade play as well, haven't you? So yeah. That's, yeah. How yeah. did that go? Oh, that went brilliantly. We got amazing audience responses. It was a great production from Kabosh, so fantastic cast. So it, yeah, I'm still in the high from it, so. Brilliant, yeah. so now the book side as well, your sixth collection, I believe, of short stories. We had an extract there from McCrory's Millionaire. What's all that about then? Well, that one's about the time I brought a millionaire to my parents' house and they were very excited thinking I was going to marry him and unfortunately it didn't work out and they were grievously disappointed. So there you go. But, but it's all about their excitement, you know, as, as parents do. So as all the stories said in this book, it's all about things that have happened to you in your journey through life then. Is it all, is it all true? Well, I wish I had that many things to write about, Robin. You know, some, sometimes it's people tell me stories or something in the news. There can be a variety. But yeah, a lot of the, um, particularly the relationship ones, are ones that I've been through. 
I'm talking about the relationships. When you read about them in the book as well, they're always pretty raunchy, the chapters, aren't they? They're all, there's lots yeah. of sex in them. I, I like writing graphically because, first of all, it's very funny. Yeah. Secondly, uh, it, it, gives that int it gives the whole truth to what a relationship is. And those moments are just so personal to everyone. And I think we all have... We all have experiences of it, and I love to get to that because not many people can write good sex scenes, and that's the truth. Yeah, well, you do. <laughs> so they're, they're, <laughs> Thanks, they're, they're, they're very graphic in the books, so they are. How easy is it to write a short story? Because you seem to put so, so much information into these short stories. There's probably 30, 40 drafts each short story, and, and they're refined down. They're usually longer. There's pieces I put in and edit later. So it's a moving process really and it's a long process so they take about a year and a half to ideally distill mm -hmm. so it is a long process the, the immediate writing is only like two or three days but it's a long process overall and the writing almost come easy to you yes it does i i actually Even as have, a child were you writing stories and things i was i had a diary as a child and that was the one that got me into trouble at school because my friends read it where I'd written terrible things about them. So um, I probably still write terrible things about my friends, but they kind of are used to it now. So uh, they know they know not to take it too seriously. And I change everything. Everything is not as it is. Um, but yeah, I've always found writing fairly easy because I can't honestly keep up with all the ideas I have. Right. Yeah. So I've got a note book full of ideas that I haven't even done. So you're probably sitting there with, with stuff for years down the line that you'll be producing. I then. think I have till wow. I'm about 96 <laughs> and then I might call it a day Robin. <laughs> and did you always want to be a professional writer and, and, and do this full time? Yeah, yeah I always wanted to be a professional writer. I write from the start. Uh, yeah I suppose even started off wasn't it school magazine writing about a tortoise who liked apple pie. That was my first story uh, in the school magazine when I was five. So I think, I think it's always been that way. And of course, you had various jobs and adventures and stuff after that, which I suppose give you good stuff to write about then as well later on, wouldn't it? That's it. I mean, you're under a lot of pressure, I suppose, to lead an interesting enough life. And it means you have to travel a lot, have a lot of different jobs. And what was I the think, worst job you ever did? Oh, the worst job. Uh, sausage roll factory. <laughs> I remember working in it and coming out of it with big, like, clumps of sausage roll on my shoes and going to the pub, like, leaving bits of sausage roll all over the pub floor. So what else then, apart from sausage rolls factories, where else did you work? Uh, I'd won in a chicken factory and I absolutely... It sounds even worse. It was actually... I used to get... Um, uh, chill blains on my fingers because they were frozen fingers you had to pull apart the or frozen chickens and yeah so my hands were a mess as you can imagine after it sort of so freezing wow. yeah I was doing a job recently where I had to interview a guy who worked in a chicken factory as well but had been there all his life and his big exciting part was working his way up to get into the slaughter room or the slaughter hall they called it the slot. And he was so excited. Horses for courses, Robin. Some yeah. people love that. And some people loved working in the factory because it was just, you didn't have to think. Your mind could soar and they were brilliant at it. I never graduated. I had like a white cap and I never graduated to the red cap, I'm afraid. It was no good at all. Yeah. So if you weren't a writer full time, what would you be doing right now, do you think? Uh, I would be dead <laughs> because there is only one thing I can do and yeah. it's right. And I always say I don't uh, fit writing into my life. I fit my life into writing. So that's it. So everything is geared around that. And of course, you're writing the plays as well. And they're two different things, really. Two completely different things. I think short they? stories and plays are very much related. Uh, they have, there's a scenic sense in all of that. And it's all to do with editing. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I'm best at short stories and um, yeah, plays rather than novels because I'm an inveterate uh, perfectionist. Yeah. It's perfectionism really, yeah, that drives me. Tell us about the new book then, okay? Love in the Time of Chaos. Um, obviously coming out of a lockdown and stuff like that, that's featured in the book? Yes, there was a lot about that. It was about the skin hunger that we all felt through lockdown and how we had to go on Tinder to have relationships. So there's a big feature of Tinder in it and online relationships, which is very true. 
uh, to life. And yeah, there, I mean, there's so many things. There's a lot. There's a troubles memoirist who talks about, yeah, looking back at the past. There's always the past. Being Northern Ireland is. But the great thing about your books, they're, they're not troubles heavy. It's not, it's not forcing the troubles no. back again. You know, oh, no, I would never. I, I like the contemporary look. And mm. it, I, it's just a sort of echo and a haunting of the past rather than a major feature. I, I love just what is modern. I have something about um, the seaboard at Larn and things. So I'm trying to keep it. I have a thing about Ukraine, a story about that, about aid workers in there. Mm. So everything is trying to be, yeah, of 2023. One called Magabri, is that about the prison? It is about the prison, yes. And it's about uh, a police officer who uh, is caught for drink driving. So that's really, yeah, a big story about that, yeah. And you mentioned uh, love in the time of lockdown. That's obviously the, the Tinder story. Did you ever have any Tinder disasters? So? Disasters? Yeah, well, being stood up all the time. Really? Actually, yeah. Yeah, they never turn up. Uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. I don't know what... It, but, I mean, they always say they look at you at the door, but I'm sure it's not that, and then turn around. No, no. I, yeah. They never turned up. No, uh, um, just, I think, it is... The, but they don't get back either. I think a lot of people on Tinder try to... They want to conversation, but yeah. maybe they're in relationships and they uh -huh. don't actually want to meet anyone. So that's what I've kind of figured out. Yeah. And you're still swiping away or have you given up on that? I gave up on that purely for a search, Rob. And I, <laughs> I don't have to go on Tinder. You know, they're just one, at my book launches and play launches. You can imagine, you know, you just get men coming up to you. Obviously, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about another one of these stories in the book. Though. What else should we look at? What about um, Estrogen City? Yeah, that was one I wrote for the BBC. And that was about how, oh, I, I read an article about how uh, women are outnumbered by men in Belfast two to one, right. which is really, so it was like, I went, and funnily enough, I went to speed dating and men were, there were 15 men and five women. So it totally was borne out. Yes, and it yeah. was terrible because we just had to wait for the men to be ready. You know, it was like they were so lucky and we were completely sort of ignored, really. Yeah. I never so, got the whole speed dating thing because I used to host a singles night at Bar 7 ah. down at the Odyssey. And they wanted me to do speed dating. I said, no, let's do it the old fashioned way. You just get groups of men and women, get them in, I'll play a few games, they'll mingle and pull, hopefully. And that's what happened. Yeah, the old it's better way to because do it. it's the pressure you're under. It's like three minutes each person. And, and you're like, the, the pr yeah. And then it's like, ding, ding. And you've <laughs> only just got started. I've only just asked you. Yeah. And, and it's the most embarrassing questions. What do you do? Where do you live? Or, well... Here with it in Northern Ireland, we probably don't ask that one because no. it's slightly <laughs> sensitive, but yeah. Well, we're just trying to work out the person's religion. We ask them where they live as well. We, we do we that. We still do that, don't we're we? We're still doing that, yeah. That, that's what a speed dating is. So I want your religion, your age, your, your job, everything in three minutes. Brilliant. Let's have a look at another one. Let's do one more because these stories are just brilliant. Tell us about uh, Mountain Gods. Oh, that was a brilliant one because we went to... Uh, it was a literary festival in India, up in the Himalayas. Wow. So really, it's based, very loosely based on that, but it is, it's kind of, we saw a tiger. We saw, well, the Himalayas itself, Mount Everest in the distance, and all of those beautiful things. But then, and then of course, there's a romantic thing with an Indian man. As many of my stories end up with, <laughs> not all. No, yeah. they're not all like that, but yeah. You, you didn't bring him home to meet the parents? No. Uh, I think that was another married one, actually, so <laughs> no. <laughs> Brilliantly. But, yeah. Rosemary, the book's out now. Where can we get our hands on a copy? Uh, it'll be in Waterstone soon uh, and no alibis, but you can buy it in Book Depository. Brilliant. As always, good to see you. Thank you so Great. much for coming in. Thanks very much, Robin. Thank you. Now, the National Theatre are on their way back to Belfast with uh, the Ocean at the End of the Lane, which opens at the Grand Opera House on Tuesday and runs through until the 25th of March. We'll be chatting to a couple of the cast members right after this. Here's a clip from the Ocean at the End of the Lane. I like stories. Peter Pan. 
Alice in Wonderland. Nothing looks like what it is on the inside. What makes you who you are? Your face or what you do? There's things what lurk out there. <laughs> Can you be brave? This, it isn't pretend, it is real. All of it was dreamed into existence. Go away! Give me my car! No, you stay out, stay out! Will anything ever be like it was before? And I'm pleased to say that Finty Williams and Amy McGoldrick join us now. Great to see you today. How are we today? Grand, thank you. How are you? Very well, thank you. So I want to start off with Amy because it must be great to get back home to Northern Ireland. Yeah, I'm so excited. I cannot wait. I've been counting down the weeks till we're, till we're there. And have you played the Grand Opera House stage before? No, never. Um, been loads as a child to the Panto, so I'm really looking forward to getting to play that stage and have friends and family come as well and see the show. She's okay. literally been talking about this since we were in rehearsals. <laughs> and Finta, you must have been to Belfast over the years, have you? I, I haven't been to Belfast for 24 years. I was last there when Mrs. Brown was being shown there. So, um, yeah, 24 years ago. So I'm really excited. So tell us about the play then, The Ocean at the End of the Lane. It's been getting fabulous reviews. So for people who don't know, what's it all about then? It's a play about a young boy who, well, actually um, a 40-year-old man who goes to a place be, to attend his father's funeral and has a weird connection to this particular place that happened when he was 12 years old. And it's a retelling of his memory uh, and the people he met and how he dealt with certain things and how he sees family and relationships and friendship. And it, it's, it's a cyclical story you'll understand if you come to see it but it's a story that happens to him again and again and again through his life and you play the character of old mrs hemstock what's she like uh, she's a billion years old <laughs> which is great i turned 50 and got cast as a woman who was a billion years old um but she is she's a grandmother and she's a mother and she is uh, a woman of the earth and of her surroundings and she's a little bit magical. Amy tell us about your role. Um, I'm part of the ensemble which is just an incredible group of people um, that help make this show happen and make the world magic um, and we are like a part of the boy's imagination yeah. and there to sort of help him along the way and tell the story um, yeah they are, Robin, what I call the super people, because <laughs> in 33 years of acting, I've never done anything that is dance or movement based. And these people, I can honestly say, because I get to spend enough time off stage watching what they do. I remember seeing the end of the first half when we were in rehearsals and I cried. Oh. And I think last night I saw it for, I think, the 78th time. Yeah, roughly. And I still come off stage and totally fangirl these people because they are so extraordinary and so brilliant and what they do is like out of this world. And for anybody who wants to work in theatre, the National Theatre has to be the ultimate goal, doesn't it? I think so. Yeah, it's definitely a pinch me moment to get to work on something like this and with the people that are on it as well. It's been very, very special. Now, this is quite a long run as well. I think it's uh, the longest running national show since uh, before COVID, isn't it? I think so. We're on this. We, we started in October. Yeah. And we're on it definitely until the middle of this October. Wow. So we're all going to be a year older by the time <laughs> we finish this play. 
<laughs> a lot of birthdays. Yeah. Yeah. Fenty, I have to mention your famous mother, who of course is uh, Dame Judy Dench. And I was on all your social media channels earlier on today, and there's some fabulous photographs and videos of you and your family. It must have been great fun growing up with uh, Dame Judy Dench and uh, Michael Williams' parents. It was great fun. It was great fun. Um, they were, until I was, well, until my mother got the Bond franchise uh, when I was 19, they were jobbing actors, you know, and we didn't go abroad in the summer. We went and took a tent up to the west coast of Scotland and, uh, you know, it was it was a wonderful world to grow up in as a child. And you must have been meeting great people as well. Yeah, some of the best people. I still get horribly starstruck by people as well. I think the first time I met Piers Brosnan, uh, my mother described me as a cartoon character who'd been splattered across all the walls. I think it took me about five years to be able to utter a single sentence to him. And it must have been great to appear with your mum in a film. You were in uh, Mrs Brown together, weren't you? We did Mrs. Brown together. We did Ladies in Lavender together. Um, yeah, it was. it's a real privilege. It's, I'm really lucky. And were your parents always supportive when you decided this was going to be the career for you? No, they wanted me to do anything other than this. <laughs> uh, I think they'd have been really happy had I done almost anything else, only because they knew the side that I didn't see growing up. You know, they knew about the financial side of it and the unpredictability of it uh, and all of those things but I never saw any of that I had to learn that for myself and what about uh, you Amy where did your acting inspiration come from did you have any showbiz people in your family not really my grand is always in the Pantos and Castle Derg in County Tyrone and I just um, ever since I was little wanted to be Annie because of the ginger curly hair <laughs> and um, I was very lucky my, Mum and Dad sent me to wee classes and I studied drama at Queen's University in Belfast So, um, and then went to drama school in London and worked with the Lyric Theatre and got to know the movement associated on this. Yeah. So that's how I've ended up here. And is it she also is like an thing? angel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you open in Belfast at the Grand Opera House on a Tuesday and the show runs until the 25th of March. Finty, is there a favourite part in the show that you have? Yes, watching this lot. <laughs> They're amazing. The, the whole show is, is full of magic and illusions and puppets and amazing music. It's been brilliantly directed by Katie Rudd. Um, it, it's, it's a really, really exciting evening. And it's unlike anything I've ever been involved with and anything I've ever seen. Uh, and and please come and see it for, for Amy and <laughs> all the movement people because they make this show. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Finty and Amy, great talking to you and have yourselves a great time here in Belfast. Thank you we so will. much, Robin. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. <laughs>so as well as the ocean at the end of the lane let's see what else is happening throughout belfast and beyond over the next week or so here's our what's on guide and we're starting off in a dairy stroke london dairy at the millennium forum and uh, cleona hagen brings her dolly parton a songbook show to the millennium forum on the 23rd of march the award-winning Banbridge Musical Society. They're delighted to present the much-loved family classic, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And that takes place at the Marketplace Theatre in Armagh from the 23rd until the 26th of March. The highly acclaimed actor, comedian and writer, Sarah Pascoe, brings her hilarious a new tour to the Ulster Hall here in Belfast on the 25th of March as well. And uh, what about uh, taking part in the Belfast Punk Experience? It's a brand new walking tour, workshop and gig that will take place for the first time on Saturday, the 25th of March in Belfast Music Hub, the Oh Yeah Centre. Tickets are on sale now from Visit Belfast and they're only £25. And the interest in the story of punk music's eruption in Belfast dates back to the late 1970s and that continues to fascinate both visitors to the city and locals alike. 
like. And with the pop-up punk choir to feature in the Belfast St. Patrick's Day Carnival and the Good Vibration Show set to return to the Grand Opera House in Belfast this coming May, now seems like the perfect time to launch an exciting activity that will help guests savour the authentic punk experience in one afternoon. And Dolores Fisher will take you on tour at that event. Uh, for more details, check out the website, which is creativetoursbelfast.com. And finally for now, if you want to catch a movie in cinemas this weekend, why not uh, check out the latest in the Scream franchise? Scream 6 has arrived. And four survivors of the Ghostface murders leave Woodsboro behind for a fresh start in New York City. However, they soon find themselves in a fight for their lives when a new killer embarks on a bloody rampage. Okay, a, a brand new statue is going to be unveiled in Newry later on this year. It's um, this, actually. Footballing legend Pat Jennings, and uh, to tell us more about uh, the project, which has actually been put together by my good friend Kevin McAllister, I'm pleased to say footballing legend Jerry Armstrong and music legend Tommy Sands join us now in the studio. Guys, welcome. Good to see both of you, Thank and you. Uh, good to see you here to talk about this today, this very special statue. This is just the model of it, and already this is very heavy, so imagine what the real thing is going to look like when it's unveiled. Many tons. I'm told it's going to be... Um, the, the actual statue is going to be seven feet tall and then the plinth is going to be four, so it's going to be pretty tall. And the guy behind it who's doing this is a guy who was responsible for the Beatles statue and lots of other big stars. Uh, yeah. Pelly and all, he's, he's supposed to be the best in the UK, so we're, we're very pleased. I mean, the actual statue there, that's only a small uh, version of it, but yeah. uh, it looks really impressive. You can see Pat, the way he held the ball in one hand, yes, which yeah. is signified Pat Jennings, and his stance, everything's perfect, it looks great. And it's the first thing you notice when you, when you see Pat and you meet him for the first time, it's the size of his hands. Well, it came in handy on a lot of occasions. I was <laughs> on the park when he used to shout, Pat's ball or keeper's ball, and yeah. he would come running out and he'd put one hand up and he'd catch it and pull it down with one hand. And, you know, we were amazed way back in the mid-70s when Pat was doing this, but he was so special. In my opinion, he was the best goalkeeper in the world for around four or five years. Wow, we'll talk more about your memories in a second, but Tommy, everybody in Newry has a special affection for Pat. In fact, everybody in, in Northern Ireland has a special affection for him, don't they? Very much so. Uh, I, I knew Pat a long time ago, and then I knew him through his uh, football and uh, appearing in, on television, uh, just like Jerry. In fact, it's great to, to be... Uh, Close to you, Jerry. Here, I've seen you before at events like this. But in fact, we were looking for you outside there earlier on, and uh, we, we all get lost before we came. <laughs> but but, but uh, I, I was sort of looking out for a green jersey, and uh, because I associated you uh, by scoring goals and things like that. But uh, you were dressed just like the rest of us. <laughs> but I, I think I think Pat was very important and is very important to. Uh, to the whole area uh, and uh, just looking at the, the statue there uh, it's a very interesting one because it gives a sense of both movement forward and safety you know when you see the ball in his hands you know that's safe yes yeah I, and uh, I, I think one of the uh, the whispers that you would hear when Pat would arrive home would be big Pat Jennings is here yeah and suddenly the atmosphere changed. Yeah. There was a sense of excitement, all right, but there was a sense of uh, neighbourliness and shelter, mm -hmm. uh, and you felt good. Yeah. And I think, uh, and, and Pat transcended all sorts of uh, barriers and divisions. Well, he's used his celebrity over the years for so much good, really, hasn't he? Well, exactly. Uh, b because being a celebrity like Pat or Jerry or anyone who would be in, in front of people, uh, it's, it's a big opportunity to do things. And uh, both Jerry and Pat. P Pat, uh, I remember often I, uh, you know, I mentioned to him, you know, a friend was sick or ill and uh, a nephew of mine actually who had leukemia, leukemia. And he came down and again somebody says, Big Pat Jennings is here, and <laughs> suddenly everything changed. And uh, so it, it's it's my memory of him. And uh, in fact, I, I wrote a bit of a song uh, which I wanted to sing for you tonight. 
but uh, my throat is, is not too good at the minute, but I'll give you a chorus of oh, it just yeah, to that'd illustrate be great, that. Yeah. Tell me, have you seen him sailing through the air, diving like a swallow when the crowds go crazy? Still you hear them whisper, no need to fear, big Pat Jennings. Is here. <laughs> and so well that was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jerry, you obviously knew Pat for many years, both on and off the pitch as well. Do you remember your first meeting with him? 1975 when I signed for Spurs. Yeah. And I mean, he was the star yeah. at uh, White Hart Lane. And there was a lot of stars there with Martin Chivers and Steve Perryman and co. But Pat was a superstar. Yeah. And um, it was a year later, 1976, I had my first call up for Northern Ireland. And we were flying out to Israel and uh, for an, a friendly match. And Dave Clements was the manager. And Pat couldn't go on the Sunday with the rest of the squad, he came in on the Monday because he was receiving the PFA award. Now to get the PFA award is something special. Yeah. And he got it on two separate occasions, Pat. So it tells you how good he was and how much esteem he was held in with other professional footballers. But, you know, I, I watched him play and make saves that no other goalkeeper in the world could yeah. make. And he just give you that assurance. And certainly in the international team, when we played out in Spain and in Mexico, we had that assurance. We always had Pat Jennings behind us, and uh, that made you feel a little bit safer, you know. And of course, it was a big part of 1982, and we, we celebrated that last year with the Spirit of 82 event in the Europa, which was a fabulous night, wasn't it? It was. It was great to get all the, the lads there, so many of them turning up, Jimmy Nickel and, and Pat, and of course Martin O'Neill and yeah. John McClellan. I mean, it was fantastic turnout, and... Um, we had a ball, didn't we? Yeah. It was real fun. I have to say, it was a great night and 40 years. I can't believe it was 40 years, Robin. Yeah. But uh, wonderful memories, you know. Well, keep the memories going because there's some photographs in front of you, Jerry. There, yeah. if, you, if you would like to talk us through those, uh, who's that guy in the first one there? That, that's. I mean, he just commanded respect. Yeah. When he uh, had the yeah. ball in his hands or in one hand, yeah. he commanded respect. And what he did on the park was amazing. And he he broke all sorts of records. Yeah. You know, he broke records for Tottenham. He broke records. You know, for Arsenal, he broke records for Northern Ireland. Um, he was our our our. our um, had the most caps, 119 caps he had for Northern yeah. Ireland. And, um, you know, this is, this is when I remember him as well. You can yeah. see there, Jimmy Nickel alongside him was Pat. And Pat could kick the ball the full length of the pitch. Wow. You know, he could hit the ball and the ball would suddenly come down to me and Billy Hamilton. We were trying to get on the end of it on the opposition's penalty area, which was uh, fantastic. And that one there against, um, you can see, it looks like it's Graham Roberts. I think it is for, for England. And Pat, her high as he, he was a great athlete. He could yeah. jump above everybody. He had wonderful spring in his feet and making saves. That, that's what he was good at. And of know? course, Pat and George Best are very close. They, they shared a room and all yes. together way back in the beginning. He, he was, um, Pat, 20 odd years. He played international football. Yeah. I did 10 years yeah. now. The first 10 years Pat did was with George. Yeah. And that's George and Billy Bingham, wow. our manager back in the 60s and they made their debut together 1967 I think it was against Wales and Northern Ireland beat Wales in Wales 3-2 wow. and that was George and Pat's debut together at the same time and there's a great action shot there of George oh brilliant yeah. you know yeah wonderful wonderful shots and then this one is from the World Cup in 82 before the big game against Spain brilliant and that was uh, that was uh, the team that performed so well that night you know all heroes every one of them and of course, when you guys are playing at the height of the troubles and stuff, I mean, Pat kind of bridged that divide between the two communities, didn't he? He did. He was so quietly spoken, but he commanded respect. Yeah. And still to this day, yeah. you know, he's, he's just, he's won everything. Yeah. He's done it all. And that's why I think it's, it's only fitting that he, he gets the statue. And um, I'm glad we're getting it now. You know, we should have got it maybe 10 or 15 yeah. years ago. But uh, he's still doing what he does best. He does lots of charity work. Cooperation Ireland he's been working for for over 25 years now but he does uh, a lot of work and he's an ambassador for McDonald's he's ambassador for a lot of uh, f very worthy causes so, uh, yeah. and I'm pleased to call him a friend I'm right. a roommate we roomed well he had the first 10 years with George Best yeah. and then the next 10 years with me so <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a mix at all, I don't even know Pat wouldn't even have said to me if I did or not you know yeah. but um, you know there was only one the night before the Israel game which was to qualify for the World Cup Pat had a migraine and he got them occasionally every one or two years he would get one and it kept them up at one o'clock in the morning we had to get the doctor 
and um, he was saying, you get, can you get Jerry to another room? And I said, I'm not going to another room. He said, stay in my room, mate, you know? Mm. And we got him sorted. He got an injection about two o'clock in the morning. And then the next morning he woke up, he was as good as gold. Wow. And he went out and did what he normally does and kept a clean sheet against Israel. And we beat them 1-0 and qualified for the World Cup Finals. Brilliant, wow. Amazing stories, amazing memories. Uh, Tommy, we've got a gala dinner coming up as well in May, haven't we? Yes, I'm really looking forward to that. On the 28th of May in a in the Canal Court in Uri, and uh, I, I believe it's it's almost sold out. Uh, but, but I think there's still some. I think it's your tickets already ah, there, Jerry. That's it. That. That's a big yes. day. It's going to be a fabulous occasion. And I'm hearing whispers of some of the names who could be there on the night. So if you have got a ticket, you're in for a pretty special night, aren't you? It's going to be very special, uh, yeah. and I suppose it's indicative of, of of Pat's outreach as well. That so many people want to be there, mm -hmm. and uh, people from. He, he was very friendly with a lot of the people like Luke Kelly and all those people down through the years. And, uh, well, Luke's not around, but a lot of people are uh, yeah. and uh, will be want to contribute. Because I think, in many ways, uh, statues are raised to people almost willy-nilly sometimes. And you've got generals who lead people into wars and up on statues all over the place. But uh, Pat was the sort of person who, and is the sort of person, and very much is the sort of person, that uh, actually contributes very positively to the well-being of people uh, yeah. off the field uh, as well as on it. I often think, you know, as a musician, you, you'd play and so on, and you'd be playing a lot of notes during the night, and the, you might hit the odd bum note. But a goalkeeper, he, he can't hit bum notes one one miss and it's a goal mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, it, it it must be it must be fairly nerve-wracking but uh, i think he was beyond that uh, he was uh, he seemed to be very much uh, uh, content in his ability yes you know i talk about steve davis and and uh, his performances for Northern Ireland. he's a very consistent player and i always say he's a seven or eight out of ten every every game pat jennings was the same he was always up there and he would make saves that he had no right to. But we expect it from him now. Yes, I mean, you yeah. see what he can do. Yeah. And he expects it from himself. He puts himself under pressure. Yeah. You know, and if he felt he made a mistake, he would criticise himself afterwards and say, and I say, listen, Pat, there's not another keeper in the world could have saved that one that went in, you know. But he's just such a down to earth man and um, he's great company. And uh, you know, everybody who's met him and Tommy's the same and uh, we all know what a gentleman he is and uh, what, what he's contributed to Northern Ireland over a lengthy, lengthy career. Exactly. Well, we'll finish the show off with your new song to Pat. We'll finish with that. Tommy, there's so much I could talk to you about, about working with Bruce Springsteen and Dylan and people like that, but we'll have to get you back another time to do that. I'd love to, Robin. Sure. Can you're still working away in the music. You're out on tour in Scotland next week, aren't you? And all over yes, the that's right. Uh, doing a tour over in Scotland and in Denmark uh, later on and the uh, so, still that, it's, 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 it's too late to stop. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, Tommy and Jerry, good to see both of you. Thank Thanks you so much for thank coming you. in. That's all we have time for on the show this week. Thank you to all my guests. Thank you for watching and to play us out with that fabulous song for Big Pat Jennings. Here's Tommy Sands. See you next week. Bye-bye. Sailing through the air, dying like a swallow, and the crowds go crazy. So we did the spell. No, we did it. A gentleman's is he. A gentleman's is he. Born in Uri City, when it was just a town. Big Pat Jennings is here. Big Pat 
Jet Mix is here.